The title of my talk, you'll notice, is a little bit uh, cryptic. Um, I promise I haven't wandered into the wrong conference by mistake. Uh, this is going to be a talk about mindfulness, but I'm also one of those people with all the brain pictures um, that Dr. Chow was talking about just now, so you can get to see some of those uh, along the way as well. Before we begin though, I'd just like to invite everyone to take a moment and just stop. And just relax. Don't think about anything in particular. Alright, now imagine that during those few seconds, I was taking some kind of a movie of the activity that was going on inside of your brains. What do you think you might see? Well, many of you might say, nothing particularly interesting. You know, I wasn't asked to do any particular task. I wasn't watching a movie up here on the screen. You might think, well, I'm not going to see anything particularly special. But what I'm going to show you today is that when we do go inside the brain and we look in the brains of people when they're just at rest, doing nothing in particular, we get a very rich tapestry of information that we can use to say some pretty interesting things about the people um, who, are, who are going through that, that scan. So, uh, just like Dr. Lazar, um, our lab at Duke NUS uses a technique called functional neuroimaging or functional MRI to look inside the brains of our volunteers to see uh, the activity while they're lying inside the scanner. So the scanner that we use is very much like the one you see um, in the picture on the top left. And on the bottom right, what you see are the kinds of images uh, that we get out of an experiment like that, where we can look at both the structure of a person's brain, as well as the function of their brain while they're doing tasks or while they're not doing anything at all. Now, one important insight that neuroscientists have had in the last decade is that we can think of the brain not as just individual parts, but as a network. And instead of just looking at activity in different parts of the brain, we can look at how those different parts of the brain network communicate with each other and how they send information back and forth between each other. And by studying that information transfer in the brain and by looking at the brain as a network, we can actually get a much um, richer amount of information than if we just looked at activity in the brain alone. So I'm going to show you one study that was done um, in the mindfulness field using this kind of connectivity analysis. This was a study from Judson Brewer's lab at UMass Medical School. And what he did was that he got a group of expert meditators. So these were people who had been meditating for more than 10 years consistently, as well as a group of matched controls who were matched on age, race, education, and a number of other factors. And he asked these people to lie in the scanner and to do different types of meditation. And he measured the brain connectivity um, between, that differed between the meditators as well as the match controls. And what he found was that across all of these different types of meditation, brain connectivity between certain areas was indeed consistently stronger in the meditators than in the controls. So this was one of the first studies of its kind in the mindfulness and meditation space, showing that this might be a useful technique for us to understand what happens with mindfulness training and with mindfulness practice. Now the study that Judson Brewer did used a technique known as static connectivity. And what that means is that um, in the study, they assumed that the connectivity that they were measuring in people wasn't changing over the course of the several, of the several minutes that they were lying inside the scanner. Another more modern way to look at connectivity data is to think of connectivity as being dynamic. So changing over the course of sec seconds and fluctuating over minutes rather than, than just staying static over time. And by looking at the ebb and flow of this dynamic connectivity information, we can go in and look for recurring patterns over time. And these recurring patterns are what we call mental states. So all of this may seem kind of abstract, so I'm going to give you a bit more of a concrete example to give you um, more of a flavor of what we're doing here. So let's think about um, a different kind of a network to the brain. So let's think about a network of roads. And these roads connect a number of suburbs, so three suburbs that you see at the top of the screen, as well as a highway linking these suburbs to a large city that you see on the bottom. Now the purpose of the exercise I want to do here is to say, if I only have information about the traffic that's traveling on these streets, can I say anything about the state of the world? So let's see if we can do that. 
So let's take one example first, where we uh, look at the, these roads, and we see a lot of traffic going up and down this big highway, as well as a reasonable amount of traffic within the suburbs as well as between the suburbs. What kind of situation do you think that can be? Anyone want to have a guess? So I might say that if I saw this traffic pattern, this could be something like rush hour, where people are going to work at the beginning of the day, or coming back from work at, at the end of the day. Now let's take a second example. Say we have a situation where there isn't so much traffic on that big highway, but instead we see a number of cars uh, that are in the suburbs, perhaps going uh, from home to a grocery store or from home to a cinema. What could we say about this? Well, this might more closely resemble the traffic pattern we see on a weekend, when people are going about leisure activities, um, but not necessarily going um, using that big highway to get to and from work. And finally, what if I take one last look at our roads and I see that there's almost no cars on the roads um, when I take a look at that? Well, um, clearly, this could be a situation where we're looking at the roads at night, where people are in bed, or should be in bed if you don't have insomnia, uh, instead of driving on the roads. And so what we can see from this example is that indeed, I can look just at the traffic patterns that I observe and make some kind of intelligent guess about what the state of the world is at that time. And when we do brain productivity analysis, we are essentially doing the same thing. But instead of towns now, we are looking at different regions of the brain. And instead of roads, we are taking a look at the connections or the pathways between those different regions of the brain. And by our traffic, we are looking at our connectivity or the information transfer. And based on that information transfer, trying to make some guess about what the mental state of the brain might be. So uh, this very complicated looking diagram is what neuroscientists use to display data like that. Um, if you feel your eyes glazing over, uh, don't worry. One of the reviewers of the paper when we submitted this also said that they had no idea what was going on here. <laughs> um, but believe me, if you understood our road example, you can understand this as well. So um, ignore all the words for now. Those are just labels for different parts of different networks of the brain. Each row and each column in this um, diagram here simply represents one different region of the brain, or if you would like in our analogy, one town. Now if I want to see what the traffic is like between those two different towns, I'll simply read this off like a chart, find the square that corresponds to those two towns, and based on this color bar here, get some kind of idea of what the intensity of the traffic is between those two areas. So for example, very bright yellow or very bright blue parts of this diagram would represent high traffic areas, whereas the darker colors would represent low traffic on low connectivity uh, roads or networks or, or um, connections. So if you cast your mind back to the exercise that we did at the beginning of the talk, where I just asked you to sit for a while and not think of anything in particular, um, we could uh, ask a person to lie inside the scanner and do exactly the same thing. And what we find, which may not be intuitive, is that rather than seeing a very consistent pattern over time, you get a movie that looks something like this, where we see indeed a very rich chain or a rich fluctuation of information, even when the person is inside, even when the person is asked not to do or think of anything in particular. And uh, this was quite surprising to me when, when I first saw this. Um, I actually sat there when we first generated this movie, uh, looking at it for a number of minutes, um, because it kind of wanted to use it like a screensaver. Um, so based on these dynamic connectivity patterns, what we then do next is to go into those data and try and find the patterns that recur again and again over time, and try to classify those in some meaningful way. So here's one mental state that we get. Um, what you can see is that this state is characterized by um, relatively large areas of high connectivity, so those hot, bright yellow and blue colors. And we can kind of think of those, as I said, as high traffic between um, those different regions of the brain. In contrast, here's another state, which is a lower connectivity state, where um, there's relatively little bright colors, and so relatively low connectivity or low traffic going on in the brain during this time. So using this technique, we did an experiment to try and understand what the differences were in the brains of people who were naturally high 
and naturally low on trade mindfulness. Now, a lot of published studies, um, like Sarah's for example, use mindfulness training as a way to look at what happens um, in the brain and what differs structurally and functionally before and after the training. Instead of doing that, what we did was we got a large group of undergraduates and we gave them uh, a test, it's a breath counting test, to try and see what their, naturally, uh, what their natural trait mindfulness was in the absence of any training at all. And so from this large group of undergraduates, we were able to select a group that was naturally high on trait mindfulness and a group that was naturally low on trait mindfulness. And we invited those people back to our lab and we put them inside the scanner we asked them to do um, what I got you to do at the beginning of this task, which is just to lie there and not think of anything in particular. And we measured their brain connectivity as they went through these, as they went through the scan. So uh, first of all, what we did was that we found again um, two recurring states that occurred in these participants. So uh, the state on the top is a state again that has a lot of uh, high connectivity, and that you might think of as our rush hour state in our traffic example. We found another state which featured relatively low connectivity and which you can think of as sort of our, as our night state uh, from the traffic example. Uh, so here's what we got. So this is an example of the data from one of our participants in the low trip mindfulness group. So what you're looking at on the bottom right is a chart showing the amount of time they spend in their low connectivity state and the amount of time they spend in high connectivity state. And what you can see is that clearly this person does not spend a lot of time in the higher connectivity state at all. They seem to spend a lot of time stuck in this state, which features relatively low connectivity between different parts of the brain. In contrast, here's someone from the high trait mindfulness group. This person clearly spends a lot more time in that higher connectivity state. And one other thing you might notice is that when they go into that higher state, they don't kind of get stuck there. So they go in and out, back and forth, between the high state and the low state over the course of the minutes that they're inside the scanner. We can quantify this by looking at the group as a whole and looking at the differences in the percentage of time that people spend in that high connectivity state and we do see that on average the people in the high trait mindfulness group spend significantly more time in that high state than the people who are in the low trait mindfulness group. Now the next thing we were interested in doing was looking at the particular networks, looking at the particular parts of the brain that seem to be driving these changes between the two groups. And if we, when we did that analysis, what we found were many of the areas um, that had been reported before in the literature and that uh, Sarah had talked about just now. So the first network that we saw that was important was the default mode network. These are parts of the brain that are involved in things like self-referential thought, things about thinking about other people, thinking about the past and the future, or just mind wandering. The other network that seems to be important is what's known as, as the salience network. And these, this is made up of areas like the anterior cingulate cortex and the insula that we've already heard about several times today. And this is important to, uh, for orienting to environmental stimuli, for processing emotional information, as well as awareness of our internal bodily states. And we think that all of that makes um, very good sense in line with what we know about mindfulness and, what mindful, and how mindfulness changes the brain. So the final observation that we made in our data, if you recall, was that it wasn't just that the high trait mindfulness people spent more time in this high connectivity state, it's that they also went back and forth more often between the states. And I think that also squares very well with what we know about mindfulness training and about mindful people, that they tend not to get stuck for long periods of time in things like mind wandering or rumination, but they have um, just a richer um, experience of life, I guess, and they, they notice more things about the environment, they notice more things about their se themselves, or to put it more eloquently in the words of T.S. Eliot, um, that for them every moment is a fresh beginning. So the last study I want to tell you about is a clinical trial that we're conducting at the moment at Duke NUS. Uh, this is the MEDIC trial, so Meditation to Improve Cognition. And what we're doing here is we're recruiting volunteers who have a mild cognitive impairment. So this is an early stage uh, before people convert to dementia. We're giving these people mindfulness training and we are trying to see whether doing that training can help to slow their cognitive decline as well as perhaps change their brain structure and their brain function. So here we have three groups of people. The people who receive mindfulness-based training do exercises very much like what you would see in an MBSR. 
So formal exercises like body scan and breathing practice, as well as informal exercises, loving kindness, gratitude, and so forth. Our control group receives what we call cognitive rehabilitation training. So this is training to teach people skills and strategies around their cognition. So teaching them how to improve their attention, their memory, their problem solving, and so forth, using different kinds of strategies. And finally, we have a group that um, doesn't receive any treatment during the period of this intervention. So the study is still uh, underway, but I just want to show you one piece of data um, from the resting state scans that we have so far. And what this shows is that in the mindfulness-based group, from before to after the intervention, we see increases in the amount of time that our participants spend in their high connectivity rush hour state. Whereas we don't see that in the other two groups who receive the control treatments. So this is reassuring to us that uh, what we found in our undergraduates is not just something that's particular to undergraduates. Uh, many people criticize studies that are done on undergraduate populations alone, it's not being generalizable. And I think what this shows is that even in um, other very different populations, we're seeing uh, results that are quite similar to what we might expect. So what I've shown you just now, throughout this talk, is a situation where we only classify our data into two states. And that really is a simplification of, of the, the truth. So neuroscientists still aren't in very good agreement about uh, how many of these states we actually should be computing, or how many of them actually exist. So this is just to show you what happens if we take our same undergraduate data and we specify that we want a solution with five states. And you still do see the same two states that I've been talking about throughout this, this talk, but you also see three other states with very distinctive connectivity patterns. And the interesting thing is that if you look at data, for example, for school-going adolescents, this is another data set we have, we see that the five states that we derive from this adolescent data set also are very similar to the, the states that we get from our undergraduates. And even in the elderly participants, four out of those five states seem to be relatively conserved. And so again, this reassures us that what we're seeing is something that's consistent across um, a very wide uh, range of populations and not just something that's idiosyncratic to particular data sets. So I'm going to wrap up here. I hope I've given you a little glimpse into the kind of work uh, that we're doing. Uh, this work is still very much in its infancy, and I think there's a lot more to learn about what these states exactly represent in terms of behavior and why people are cycling through these states over time. Uh, but we're excited to be part of that work, and uh, we, look, we very much look forward to finding out more. So thank you for your time.